Morning, everybody. Forgive me for changing the furniture. Poor old guy was battling to know where to put all his stuff. Um, when I preach, I really like to be able to reach out and get at you. So uh, if you don't mind me, it's a great pulpit, but I'd like to point my fingers at you. How's it to the guys watching online? And, uh, you know, it's amazing how our paths cross. A uh, guy has alluded to it. Uh, Gene, are you here in this meeting or were you from the last meeting? There you are, Gene. Um, it's amazing. Gene came up to me in the tea break and um, she introduced herself to me. Now, Jean is personal friends with my aunt, and I'm the youngest in the, my whole family, and I remember people talking about this lady, and she's a, she lived near my sister, and so it's this amazing thing, here we are in uh, White River, and this lady I've never met, but has kind of tracked my whole family for so long, and then um, a lady, uh, Laurent, came and said hello, and she said she was born in Nîmes, now I have traveled just around the corner, about half an hour, uh, 50 minutes away to Montpellier where they play the rugby. And uh, it's just so cool how these little contexts, little contexts happen. You know, you're part of a family, right? Part of family around the world. You're not on your own. Church, uh, uh, CU, White River, you're not alone. And that's not just because there's a few other CUs around there. That, that just, okay, we're a, you're a family of churches. But I want to say to you this morning, you're not alone. And you're not alone as a believer, as an individual. But we are part of this great, expansive inheritance around the world. You may remember when God, um, you know, I've always got to get my Moses, my Noahs, my Abrahams, and everyone in the right place. Who was in the boat? Anyway, um, <laughs> God says to Abraham, remember, he's in his tent, and he's complaining, Lord, how are you going to ever fulfill your promises? God says, come outside and look at the stars. And I would suggest to you this morning that perhaps we're in our tents and we're looking at the ceiling and we're thinking, God, you're small, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm cramped, There's how are you ever going to get me beyond me or how are you going to fulfill the things that are uncomfortably stirring in me? I've had a terrible last two weeks, haven't you? Um, we've sat in NCMA international team meetings for a week, we've done translocal training, we've done the equip here, I've done the equip in, in GP, I left the Thursday morning meeting, got in the car, came here for the Thursday evening meeting here, and I've been, I've, I've, I've been uncomfortable, I've been provoked, I feel like I've got pebbles in my shoes and blackjacks in my pants, if you can excuse me. I just want to burst, don't you? You're wondering what on earth have you got this guy from Pretoria for? Friends, there is this bigness that God has called us to. And sometimes we get so claustrophobic, we get so um, um, squashed into our little tents that God needs to call us to come outside and look at the stars in the heaven. And then he said to, to Abraham, he said, that's what your descendants will be like. Isn't that amazing? And you might just be in a small little one man. You know, have you ever read the labels on, on tents, any campers here? You know, they say like a 14-man tent, and it's like a meter and a half squared. H have you seen that? Yeah? And it's no wonder, you know, and then the wind blows, and the tent's against your face, and you're trying to breathe with a straw out the window to try and get something in. It's, it's, it's not the most comfortable job, you know. Someone said, how, how rich do you have to be to go and live like a homeless person for the weekend and call it fun? <laughs> and here we are in our tents, and sometimes God will call us out of... <laughs> out of our experience and call us to look beyond what's pressing in on us and breathe deeply and say, man, you can be multiplied like the stars in the heaven. Your reach, your impact, your influence can go way beyond what you think it could be. I remember going to Malawi years ago. They built a 7,000, 6,000 seater uh, where we had equips there. And I remember you walk into a building that size and it takes your breath away. You, you, you struggle for breath. There's something that happens. And I'm trusting this morning that as we've gathered, I'm trusting you'll come out of your tents, you'll look at the skies, <laughs> and you'll breathe like there's no oxygen in your lungs and you'll be stirred to say, Jesus, whatever it is, could you make me bigger than I am now, we've heard over the equip that God's a big God. He's called us to go beyond just the little where we am. And so my very first trip, uh, I got uh, saved in grade 11, and I joined a church, and uh, the church partnered with NCMI, and my very first trip that I went with a pastor of that church uh, on a, quote, apostolic trip was to a church in Scottborough. 
Now, he went there to ordain an elder who, not long after that, decided that God was calling them to plant a church in Nelspruit. Roland and Patty Barnard. The very church that Guy then, and Guy and Cheryl ended up leading a little bit later, then we left the coast. We went to Joburg for a couple of years now in Pretoria. And here we are today again, just uh, paths crossing over and over again. Can I encourage you this morning to be wise who you walk with? Because you may well walk with them for a while and they'll leave an imprint on your life. They may even chart your course of your destiny. I was 7, 16 when I got saved and I walked into this church in a school hall and there was a man uh, leading worship on the drums. His name is Johnny Dale. He was a bodybuilder. He owned a gym. He'd, ex he'd, he'd worked out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So he was one of those guys back in the day. And uh, he was in his 40s and I was, in, I was 16. I mean, he was a grandpa as far as I was concerned. You know, and he made himself my friend. He chose to be my friend. And Johnny Dale and Lindsay Evans and many other men shaped me. And over the years, and continue to, like my relationship with Guy, we've shared a double bed, just so that you know in full disclosure. <laughs> shaped me in all sorts of ways. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I think we do life, and we, people come across our paths, not all of them sent by the Lord. And if we'll be wise, and maybe you work with the leaders of your church, and you'll find yourself crossing paths and linking hearts with people that you never know where you'll end up. You'll never know in five years or 10 or 20 or as Guy says, even 30 years. And we're just starting. We're just gathering momentum, Guy and I. Um, um, we're just starting out. And I would encourage you to choose wisely. It doesn't mean they've got to look like you or sound like you. you know, we've got an a, a, a international businessman in our, in our church, highly... Um, Highly successful. He's going to speak at a conference in a few weeks' time, and he's, he and his wife are going to be one of a hundred people that get to see the Pope. Um, he regularly eats meals. And his wife says, I never know these people because the, the presidents in Europe change so much, but I ended up sitting next to the Swiss president. And, and so they talk, they, they, they live at a level higher than you and me. And this man, they've been in South Africa for seven years. He came to our church. They didn't know any, and he met a man, uh, a man that also has incredible influence, but they didn't compare their CVs. And this man, one of our deacons, his name's Mzu, he, um, he invited my, f my new friend straight away. He invited him home for lunch. We had dinner with this couple a few weeks later, and this man said, you know, that guy who invited me to, to lunch from church has been an answer to my prayers. I prayed for seven years for an African friend. He said, that man has become my friend. And I encourage you, be wise who you walk with, who you join your hearts with, because who knows the exploits? Who knows the Caleb's who your Joshua will be? Who knows the Paul's who your John Mark will be? Who knows the Silas's who your Barnabas's will be? And so on and so on. The Titus, be very wise. Because God wants to take us far. Is that okay? And so, uh, here we go. I've got to do some maths now. It really is. It's been a delight to be here. I have to say, my first time here in uh, this region, and it really has been a delight. The equipment's been amazing. Your um, chasfrahit, your hospitality has been so cool. I really love being here. So Frank Mead said that James, the brother of John, and Jesus, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, and James, the son of Zebedee, preach and are killed by mobs in Jerusalem. Matthew is slain with a sword in Ethiopia. Philip is hanged in Perga. Nathaniel is flayed alive in Armenia. Andrew is crucified in Achaia. Thomas is run through with a lance in India. Thaddeus is shot to death with arrows. A cross goes up in Persia for Simon the Zealot. And Peter is crucified upside down in Rome. Matthias is beheaded. And only John of all of the twelve escapes being a martyr for Jesus Christ. Frank Mead says, remember that this is the mold that anyone who would call themselves a disciple must follow. In the Reformation, 
A man by the name of Martin Luther campaigned. He had this revelation that we are saved by grace through faith. And he campaigned against the excesses of the church. And he, he, he was arrested because of his preaching and his faith. They, they called him a, 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 a upsetting the, the, the church. And they brought him in and they tried him for his preaching. And they tried him and found him guilty as a, as a heretic. And the, 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 the sentence was death. And they said this to him. They said, recant or be burnt at the stake. Recant means go back on what you have said. And Luther replied, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Thus I cannot and I will not recant because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. One of you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll read from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12. My goodness, what's going on here? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, it says, Therefore, and you know when you read your Bible and you see the word therefore, you have to look what it's there for. So therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now this is not the picture of angels with harps on their, on their clouds. This is a picture of the Olympic Games. You remember the Olympics as we know them began prehistory in, in Greece. And uh, it's become what we know it. And this was the picture, the, the image of the marathon runners. They would start the first lap in the stadium with the grandstands full of spectators. They'd do the lap and they'd head out into the surrounding countryside, run most of the marathon, then come back for the final lap and the clouds, would, clouds of witnesses would cheer and call their favorite to carry on. And the image that, that, that the writer of the Hebrews gives us is that of these clouds of witnesses, these believers. He tells us who some of them are in, in Hebrews 11, these, these heroes of the faith sitting on the grandstands, shouting for the runners of the race. And might I encourage you that there are men and women that have gone before us, and maybe they came. Come on, don't give up yet. I know you're tired. I know it's tough. I know you feel like you've been running hard. You might have had some bumps and bruises along the way. But come on. You can do this. We've done it before. We believe in you. Come on. You're a champion. And the picture is that of these arrayed heroes of the faith. Shouting for the runners to keep on going. The picture of competing in the Olympic Games, it goes on to say, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Those days they used to run naked because they didn't have the technology that we had today. They wouldn't want even their, their, their clothes to slow them down. A little bit like the mountain bikers and the, the road bikers today. You spend inordinate amount of money just to save 50 grams, right? Yes, everyone shows off my, my carbon fiber, this thing, that thing, and, and I've saved 120 grams. It only cost me 50,000 rand. It's cheap at the price. My question is just skip breakfast and you can save yourself 50K. Anyway, so let us throw off anything that hinders and run with perseverance. The King James says patience. The race marked out for us. Which race must you run? You must run your race, please. No one else can run your race the way you are called to run it. And your race might be uphill and my race might be downhill. But run your race. Don't look over the track and say, I wish I could run your race. Your race looks so much better to me. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Zola Bud. Remember the girl that ran? I'm allowed to call her a girl. She was young. Then she ran with no shoes. And they told her, no, you're stupid. You need, to, you need technology. You know, you need to run. And she couldn't. She took the shoes off just like Saul and uh, David and Saul's armor. And she ran for the Olympics. And there was this lady called Mary Decker Slaney. And they ran in the same lane because that's how you finish the, the, um, the, the, the marathon. And they ran too close to each other. They were trying to get into each other's race. And as the foot came up, the other foot touched and Zola Bud was on the ground. She never finished the race. I want to say to you, run the race that God has marked out for you. He goes on to say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Observe, analyze, become like Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. One of my heroes in the scriptures is Paul, and he's such a challenge to me, the way he lived his life. 
He was imprisoned. His life was at risk. He was locked down and limited, but always at Jesus' disposal to serve the gospel in any way God called him to. How was your COVID? You got used to being locked down? I remember the church lost its head. We went crazy. We believed that if we didn't give you a, a, at least a devotion and a scripture to read every morning, you were going to lose your salvation and go crazy. I, someone said to me, could you imagine if we didn't have the internet? Would the church survive COVID? It was like pastors went into overdrive. We nearly killed ourselves just hoping that the church would be okay. But we're not... Our, our, our relationship with Jesus is not based on whether the leaders are sending us devotionals for the day. You've got one. It's called the Bible. Surely we could have just said, remember, read more today. The end. Saved ourselves hours. And I mean, all of our leaders are having to prop their iPhones on piles of books and toilet rolls and tape and press stick. And, and then the kids would run past. You know how it went. It was ridiculous. We're all just trying to keep each other going. I mean, for goodness sakes. We're connected to Jesus or not? Like, I can't get out of my, my, my gate. What am I going to do? Is the world coming to an end? Now, I don't mean to be unkind. We've all suffered loss over COVID, haven't we? But I'm just trying to get us to think this morning. You don't have to like what I say, but would you please just think it through? It's all I'm asking you. My mother raised me to be polite <laughs> and to have manners, and I'm trying hard. I just want us to think this morning. Whether you agree with me or not, you have to agree with the Bible. But whether you agree with me or not, I'm just asking us to think, to do the exercise and consider that perhaps the way I'm thinking needs to have some adjustment. And Paul spent large parts of his life in jail, locked up, but not locked down. And there he was, the gospel going to the world, people coming to visit him, and he was never limited by the physical circumstances around him. He might have been in a tent, but he was not limited to the parameters of that tent. It's a challenge to me. I think the goal of most of our lives is pretty self-focused. Would you agree? Society right now is all about be the best you you can be. You do you. Man, if you want to wind me up, you say you do you, Craig. Like, how, you know, this is just my truth. Like, you can have your truth, I can have my truth. Like, what does that mean? Like, my truth is it's pretty warm today, right? What's your truth? It can't be cold today. It's like, truth is truth. And we think we can just do what, you know, do ourselves. And, and, but, man, the goal of our lives is mostly self-focused. We want to get a good job, have a happy family, save for retirement, maybe get a little holiday something house on the coast somewhere when we can go and put our feet up and read the newspaper till Jesus comes back. Paul argues that all of these things, these, these, these pursuits, should be live, lived in the context of the gospel to the nations. Peter Howard Brown said, you'll, you'll notice I quote other people when, I'm, when something tough's coming, because then it's not me. It's just someone said, um, our primary occupation is not to solve the headache of the auntie in the third row. I would never say that. It's this guy. He says, or even to help the relationship in the eighth row, our primary preoccupation, our passion, our overwhelming expectation is to become and to produce men and women who are willing to die and to bleed for the cause, who are willing to be totally inconvenienced for the cause of Christ. I'm not pointing fingers at the lady sitting in the third row or even anyone in the back row. What I'm saying is, of course, we must look after each other. But when this group becomes the focus of our attention, we... <laughs> you said it. We're literally telling the rest of the world to go to hell. And church becomes about maintaining each other's well-being than gathering together and rescuing the world. And so maintenance becomes the focus rather than purpose. Now, yes, we must care for each other, but the reason we care for each other is so that we can, as we're gaining health and wholeness, we can offer that to those that don't have health and wholeness. Make sense? John Piper says that there are only three kinds of Christians when it comes to world missions. He says three kinds of Christians. Number one, 
They are the goers. You know those crazy people who pack their bags and, and head off. Those who cross a culture to plant a church where there isn't one. Maybe those who cross the street and go to their neighbor. Or those that cross um, the, the boardroom table and talk to a colleague. Or those that cross the school playground and go and talk to someone that they wouldn't normally. Or those that cross the town or the mall or the South Africa or a border. He says, first of all, they're the goers. Second, they are the senders. Those who are agitating and fundraising and giving and praying and supporting those that go. And thirdly, he says... They are the only one left is the disobedient. Those who don't even think about it and don't care about it. You see, sometimes in churches we, uh, normally the case is that the things that, that, that come naturally to me might not to you. And we just say, that's fine, you like stamp collecting and, and flower arranging. I don't, that's fine, we can agree. We, we all get our gifts. And then we say, you worry about that and I'll worry about this. So the people that love the youth, they worry about the youth. The people that love, I don't know, something else, worry about that because we're separating. But here's the point, friends, is that it's not just the evangelists that need to worry about the lost. It's not just those crazy people that want to put tents in places and preach the gospel. This is basic Christianity, whether you like the youth, whether you like outreach, whether you like inreach, whether you like holding prayer meetings or standing on the street corners. The gospel to all nations is basic Christianity. The fact that Jesus has saved me and is in the process of healing me and making me whole is so that he can send me to offer the exact same to somebody else who doesn't have it yet. And you and I don't have to be Billy Graham. You and I don't have to be whoever it is that comes to mind when you think about talking about Jesus. We simply have to be signposts that point those around us to Jesus. And it might just be by doing business with integrity. It might just be by being faithful to your wife and loving your children. It might just be arriving at work on time. And people say, what on earth is wrong with you? You say, I'm glad you asked. Let me introduce you to the reason, the person, who makes me live the way I do. And so friends, I want to talk to you this morning about being on a cruise ship or being on a battleship in our Christianity. Lee spoke about the fact that we're called to war, we're called to battle, but sometimes the church, when it's supposed to be a base of operations, we bring the, the, we bring the battle into the base and we end up fighting each other here in the church instead of the church sending soldiers from the base to the battle. Make sense? You know, they say the dogs stop fighting when there's a cat in the yard. Have you heard that saying? It means that when there's something bigger, something larger to call your attention to, all of a sudden the, the meaningless details that seem so big in our lives fade to insignificance. We said every time a young man with lots of friends spots a young girl. Every single time. Next thing you hear, the friends are like, where's this guy? Why is he not taking my calls anymore? He's not received, turning my texts every time. Let's go hang out. Oh, sorry, I'm busy. What on earth has gone on with him? This girl has come along and ruined my friendship. You see? You're friends with other guys is not nearly as important when you suddenly find a girl that turns your heart. We bring the battle into the base. Because we don't have something that cap that's captivated our attention. Where we read, we began with Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and therefore he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That joy beset before him, part of it sits here in front of me today. And many are still to come. And that was the overriding focus that helped him embrace the cross, embrace the life on, on earth, knowing where it would culminate, because he had something bigger constraining him. And when you and I come to the, 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 the highlight of our, of, of our religious, our Christian, I use religious on purpose, our religious life is to turn up in church once in a while on a Sunday. We think Jesus is going to be so proud of us because we turned up and sat and listened. No wonder we end up boxing each other, parking. I park in your parking because I'm new here today and you're grumpy with me because who's this guy parked in the shade and I came late and I had to park in the sun. And someone sits in your seat or, or looks at you funny, doesn't remember your birthday. That's it, I'm leaving this church. They're not friendly. Be serious. 
I'm going to find another church. I'm not being fed here. Uh, have you got the Bible? I'm not exercising my faith here. They don't give me room. Really? You've got a whole week to go and tell people about Jesus. Sorry, it's the lights. I'm frowning just because of the lights. I'm not frowning at you at all. You see, in wartime, smile, Craig, your mom raised you well. In wartime, everything changes. Let's read in, in 1 Kings, uh, about King Hezekiah, sorry, 2 Kings chapter 20, about King Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was a godly king. His father was an ungodly man, and he took Israel away from God. Hezekiah became king, and he revitalized uh, uh, the Israelites' faith. He restored worship, and he counted for God. But then out of pride, he became boastful, and he boasted to the pagan nations what he had done. And God judges him. And he repents and he turns back to the Lord and he says, Oh Lord, please forgive me. And the Lord says, I'll give you another 15 years. And this is where we read. And so Isaiah says to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. In other words, your, your country will be plundered. Not only that, nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away. They will become eunuchs in, your pa in the palace of the king of Babylon, your enemy. Verse 19, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah. Does that sound good to you? Have you just read this passage? But remember God said, I'll give you 15 more years of peace. Then the calamity will come. Hezekiah says the word of the Lord is good because he reasons. Will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? I don't care about my children. I don't care about the nation beyond me. In my lifetime, I'll be, pe I'll be at peace. You see, the goal of our lives is pretty self-focused. We want a good job, a happy family. We want to save for retirement and enjoy life along the way. But Paul argues that all of this should be lived in the context of the gospel to the nations. I wonder if you'd be brave enough to agree with me. I have to. I'm guilty too. That many of us want the battle to be won so that we can, re we can rest and enjoy peace in our lifetime. You've been through a tough time? We pray and we trust God. God broke through. We need... Yes. And again, you don't know me very well, but I'm not trying to be flippant. I'm just excited. And I'm not meaning to minimize your pain, but there are times when we suffer, right? And we pray and we ask God and it seems like the suffering doesn't go away. Yes. And we say, oh God, I just, I, I, I'm at war, I'm upset, I'm, I'm hap unhappy, I'm, I'm fearful, I'm, whatever it might be, God, just give me breakthrough, just bring me peace. We read all those peace passages in the, in the scriptures, right? Yes. And we think that peace means the absence of discontent, the absence of fear. And we think, man, I'll, I'll, I'll fight this fight. Okay, it's time. I don't know, there's sickness or there's... No money or there's relational strife. I'm going to fight this fight. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. We're going to get the victory and we'll live in peace. I'm not so sure. It seems the Bible points to the fact that we are on the battlefront until Jesus returns. There's battle after battle after battle because we must win the war. And that's when we get the great well done and we truly enter into his rest. I think we must continually fight the deception that we are living in peacetime when we think that the luxury of self-indulgence is the only distraction that will break our boredom. You know, we have more stuff in this world than we ever have in all of history. I said the other night, up until 1820, 94% of the world was in an impoverished state. We have so much. We've got how many channels on TV to numb our minds. We've got so many pursuits to distract us. We have more therapy now than ever in the world. More uh, people uh, telling you to find who you are and be yourself and all of that. And yet we are the most hollow, most uh, dissatisfied people in all of history. We're looking for peace. And we're not finding it deep within. There is a war raging between heaven and hell, and Paul's heart must grip us more and more. He says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, he says, I count all things to be a loss in, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. 
God threw out the opportunity to become born again. Imagine if he instead of said, would you like to lose everything this morning? Your house, your car, your groceries, your pet, whatever toy you have. How many of us would have put our hands up? And Paul says, I count everything loss. In fact, I have surrendered everything for one thing, the knowing Jesus, my Lord, that I might gain Christ. In fact, those things to me are rubbish in comparison with, I'm not saying you have to be a hermit and go live in a cave. I'm just saying we have to get our priorities right because we end up having, having stuff, but instead of having stuff, the stuff has us. And Jesus just wants place of preeminence. He wants superiority to the things that clamor and clutter for our hearts. Jim Elliott, who was a missionary, him and I think it was five friends, became pilots and they flew this little uh, few-seater airplane into the Amazon basin and they found a place where they could land on the beach. And they wanted to go and tell an unreached tribe about Jesus. They landed the plane on the beach. They got out of the beach and the, tribe, the, the warriors from the tribe came out of the jungle and very uh, rustic tribe. All they had was sharp, sharpened sticks. And they saw these white people they didn't know anything about, these Americans, and they came and they, they murdered every single one of them on the beach. Some of them didn't even get clear of the airplane. You think, Jesus... They, they were telling people about you. Their goal, was it a success or a failure? You know, Jim Elliott's wife, um, years later, went back to that very tribe, and she made her home among them. The story goes that their son was part of the baptism of the man who murdered his father's son. The two sons were part of the baptism. This man, Jim Elliott, said, He is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain what he cannot lose. We hold on to our lives and we pad them and we sophisticate them and we comfort them and we dream about the day when we don't have to work so hard and we can just rest. And we hold on to this depreciating asset, this life, these hours of living that trickle through our hands. We hold on to that and we release eternity instead of holding on to eternity and releasing this life. He is no fool who gains, who gives what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. I want to ask you this morning, are you a passenger or a participator? You see, because passengers are all about enjoying the ride. The music's the, the right kind. The people are the right kind. It's a nice church. I like being here. They're friendly to me. I'll come back again. A cruise ship is all about pleasure and entertainment, but a battleship is all about purpose and service. On a battleship, there's no passengers. <laughs> Even you're either a personnel or you're a patient, and the patients are being bandaged up and band-aided and, and, and tourniqueted and, and crutched so that they can get back to the job they're doing because someone needs to do that job. It's amazing to me that, that, that Christians, and I'm one of them, man, it's amazing to me that we think, oh, I don't need to go to the prayer meeting. I don't need to go visit my mate because someone, like, like am I really that special? And I think most of us think less highly of ourselves than we should. When you're running late from work and you're, and, 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 and you're frustrated and you're tired and, you, and you're worn out and now you've got a customer that's coming at the wrong time, you look at your watch and it's already late for prayer meeting and you think, oh, you know what, no one's going to miss me. There's no, I, I don't need to be there. I'll go next week. And you go home and you lick your wounds and you go home tired and you wake up even more exhausted the next morning. The reason being is because we've lost sight of the fact that if I'm not at that prayer meeting, my prayers don't get prayed, my portion, my, my, my participation doesn't happen, and together I don't receive the inheritance that we will gain as we pray. The way we set church meetings up is one guy gets to talk a lot and other guys get to listen a lot. And so we think, well, it's not that important if I'm, I'm here or not. It depends whether you're coming to church for you or for the world. It just might be that God wants to use you this morning. You see, purpose brings energy. Purpose gives meaning, investment, the thrill of risk and reward. Purpose says we're in this together. P passenger brings boredom. Passenger produces drudgery, box-ticking critics. Huh. God wasn't up to speed today. He must be tired. 
I didn't really like the ser sermon series or the coffee was cold. By the time I got outside, it was finished. They didn't think of me. No one cares. It was my birthday and no one even looked at me. That's it. I'm out of here. This church is terrible. Passenger says, you better suit me. You see, in wartime, everything changes. In World War II, they ran out of um, uh, resources. And so they went from house to house asking the housewives for their pots and their pans. And they took those pots and their pans, they melted them down into airplane parts and into weaponry. And so these ladies went from the privilege of being able to choose which pot and pan should I use when I cook for my family to I've only got one if I'm lucky. Because in wartime, everything changes. My resources get surrendered to the bigger picture. I won't have any pots if the Germans come. And today we've lulled ourselves into thinking we're living in peacetime. We've lulled ourselves into thinking, man, I just want to get the best pile of pots ever. Hmm. You see, those, those are real pictures. Imagine, do do it, give me your pots and pans, your luck crusade. In 1936, they built a luxury liner called the Queen Mary. It was known as the grandest ocean liner ever, ever built. 1936, does that man, that date ring a bell? See, three years later, World War, two broke out, right? And they took the ship and they put it back in the harbor and they retrofitted it to become a battleship. So the cruise ship, I've got good news for you. If you've been setting your life up for comfort and for padding, there's retrofitting happening if you would just let it. And they put the ship back in and they, they, they changed it and, and it became a, crip, a troop carrier. And instead of these, these luxury appointments, they had bunks, bunk beds stacked seven high. You see, because re resources are allocated differently in wartime. A wartime lifestyle presents itself not a, as legalistic burden, but as a joyful acknowledgement that our resources aren't entrusted to us for our own private personal pleasure, but for the greater pleasure of stewarding them and advancing the kingdom. So they did a number of things to the Queen Mary. They, first of all, they painted out the windows. They blacked out the portals. And the whole reason you pay more for a, for a uh, cabin on the seaside so you can look at the sunrise over the ocean than you do on the inside because then you just look at the passage, right? And so first thing they did is they painted out the windows. The second thing they did is they increased the accommodations from 2,000 to 5,500 on this one boat. Then they added some guns, some, some firepower, anti-aircraft guns, submarine charges, and stealth technology. They increased the accommodations to 10,000 on one boat. Then they increased the accommodation again to 16,683. 15,740 were troops, 943 were crew. You notice the ratio? 16 to 1, fighters to helpers. And in the church today, we so easily want 16 helpers for one fighter. So let's have a look. I think this is a great example of how we can live our lives. They painted out the portholes. To me, that speaks about vision and focus. It speaks about choosing to limit my distractions, choosing to limit what I give my energy to. There are things that you and I should cut off so that we can focus. You know, when you transplant a plant, what do you do? You cut all the, the, the branches off so that the energy can go to the roots so that it can get strong, right? And it just might be that our roots are weak because we're spending all of our energy over here. We choose the best over the good. We consciously resist distractions. The second thing they did is that they put anti-aircraft guns onto this boat, this pleasure liner. And that speaks to me of spiritual warfare, owning this, the, the aerial battle above us. You see, because the devil attacks us with temptation and accusation and deception, doubt and discouragement. We sang about that, didn't we? And we respond with faith, prayer, fasting, and the authority of Jesus' name. The third thing they did was they put anti-submarine weapons onto this boat. And submarines speak to me of surprise attacks from below the waterline. You know when you're going along your day, you suddenly step in a pothole and someone stands on your toe and you react and you think, where did that come from? Hello? Someone just gently says something and you turn into a monster. That's because someone pressed you on your yeah? Surprise attacks from undealt with things that lurk below the waterline. Mm. 
unsettled issues and unwon battles. They expose our hearts when the pressure is on. The fourth thing they did is they added stealth technology, which speaks to me of discernment and spiritual gifts, because the devil comes in stealth, doesn't he? doesn't announce his presence. He just comes and he tricks us into his trap. And we need to have stealth technology, discernment and spiritual gifts where we win the intangible victories that no one may ever know about, where you love your neighbor when he hates you. And you don't come to church and say, I want to give a testimony. I'm so glad my wife fought with me and I smiled at her and I forgave her. No one will tell that testimony. No one will tell the testimony of, man, I, I want to to spend money on the wrong thing, but instead I came and I tithed. No one will tell the testimony of I was in a rush <laughs> to get to work on time and instead I drove at the speed limit. This is these intangible victories that we can win. Finally, they increase the accommodations and this for me is the crux this morning. It's personal sacrifice to make room for more. Uh, I remember a man t telling me, Picture a cake. For me, that would be either lemon meringue or baked cheesecake. There's only two cakes in the world that are important. The rest, you can forget. Carrot cake is a vegetable. doesn't count. It's basically quiche. He says, sometimes we, 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 want, we, we, we take a slice out of the cake and we think, Jesus, I'll just slip you into where that slice, I made a room for you so you can slip into, squeeze into my cake. And actually, Jesus wants us to squeeze our lives into his cake. Sometimes you and I just need to make more room for Jesus. It might be time. It might be headspace. Maybe we need to just pull back on certain risky things that we're doing. We're trying too much at once. We're busy here. We're busy there. We're busy here. And we just don't have free space in our minds for Jesus to speak to us. Rushing and busy or, or always doing something. Maybe Jesus just needs some room in the inn to come and find a place in Bethlehem. It talks of selfless Christianity. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, many of us would have been saying, oh, you know, you deserve better than this, Jesus. That's what the culture says to us today. I don't deserve this, really. Yeah? Have you watched those house programs? They give the, the couple a fancy house on TV, and they say, oh, you deserve this house, really? Why? I deserve it, why? Why do I deserve a good life? Why? According to the Bible, I deserve nothing but hell and death. Everything else is a gift from the Lord. And Jesus hanging on the cross, you would say, oh, shame, Jesus. You know, it's not fair. He was concerned about the two criminals on either side of him more than he was of his own pain and suffering. And if you want to live a battleship Christianity rather than a cruise ship Christianity, it would take us making space in our hearts and in our lives and in our days and in our, in our dreams to make room for Jesus. I remember years ago we, um, we went from just a, five, a, a small car to a bigger car, seven-seater that we could travel over the borders with and go places. I remember when I, I, I got the license, the person said to me, gee, you went from a, this car to that car, what's going on? I said, I've got more friends. Our whole life, we, Colette and I married young, we were 24 and 22 when we started leading the church. We've always lived in a house that doesn't fit our stage of life. We've always had to pay for a house that was too big for us. Why? So that we could have people come in and stay and meet in the lounge. And, and when we had our wedding, <laughs> we, <laughs> we had to make it a bring and share because the whole church needed to come. Not because we wanted them there, because they were our family. And our hearts were big. And rather than having a few and, and fancy and everyone's ooing and aahing and us being on the front page of the bridal magazine and look how fancy your wedding was, it's like, no, 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 we're getting married, but we want to share this with everybody. And sometimes we just need to make room in our hearts and in our lives. So is there a wartime way to live? Would you join me and sign up to the battleship Christianity this morning there? And, and would you join me changing the way we live, where my involvement in church becomes less about me and more about them? I want to finish this morning with some practical helps. I, I, Forgive me, I, I'm just excited. That's all. I'm not angry, and, uh, and, but I just, man, the gospel, the kingdom, the, the, the nations are waiting. There's more people in this world today that don't know Jesus than do. Rob Forbes preached on Thursday morning, and he said there are 340 language, uh, language, people, uh, language groups that in 2,000 years have not had the witness of Christ in their language. They don't have the Bible in their language, they don't have a verse, they don't have a, a, a missionary. 
Half of the world don't know Jesus. We've got to get ourselves busy. So how do I do this? I'm hoping just to give you some practical how-tos here. So number one, adopt a theology of place. Adopt a theology of place. Don't wait till you can leave White River and then your life will start. The, the Lord has placed you here, or if not, if, you don't, if you're not sure that God has put you in this town and in this church, then with respect to the elders, please find out which one He has put you in and go there. I don't want you here if you're not convinced that God has called you here and called you to fight on this battleship with this bunch of soldiers. God has called you to your city, your town, your suburb, your job, your school, and He's sending you there on mission for the gospel's sake. It's not just to pay the bills, get an education, and hope to have some time on the weekend. Number two, own your local church. We get this weird idea. We talk about, oh, this is God's church. Since when? Well, number one, it's Jesus' church. But actually, it's our church. Because the church doesn't exist until we turn up. The elders can be here and it'll just be the elders. It's then we gather together that we become the church, right? And so own it. Make it yours. Don't just talk about oh, they and them and, and what are the, the elders asking. No, this is my church. I own it. I'm invested. The prayer meeting's not going to be as good unless I'm there. The singing will be terrible unless I'm singing, whether I'm a good singer or a bad singer. My heart needs to come out my mouth. Amen. You who are here for the first time, man, those visitors are going to go home sad if I'm not there to smile at them. People in my school, they might never know Jesus unless I share my sandwich with them. Own your local church. <laughs> Get a passport. Master your money so that you're free to respond when God calls you. Train your kids to sleep on the floor and to go out with you at night. You know how many parents tell me they get kids, thank you, the Lord bless us with children. Now we can never go to another meeting for church ever again at night because the children won't sleep. Can I just suggest, if the children are leading you at three months and six months and 12 months old, they will never stop leading you. So we train our children. When we had kids, we were doing church in a school hall. My wife would push the pram up and down in the drafty school corridors, often not even in the building, the whole meeting. And she'd say, what am I doing? Why am I even here? And Colette will tell you, I'm here because my kids need to get into the routine of understanding that church is a priority and we turn up. Changed my life. I own my local church. Number three, <laughs> let me finish. Offer more. Offer more. Whatever you're offering, offer more. Offer more to the Lord. Offer more to this church. Offer more to this uh, uh, region. Offer more. Focus the purpose of your life. When we try to do too much, we're distracted. When we focus, we achieve. Number four, own a city in prayer. I hope you're praying for this city. Why don't you go to the Lord and say, Lord, would you put another city on my heart that I can pray for? If you ask me, Craig, how do you do your devotions? At the moment, I don't have a journal. I don't have a daily reading. I have the Bible and I have Google Maps. The number of days I spend in my devotions with my maps open, looking at my friends' addresses, saying, Jesus, what about this city? And what about that city? And Jesus, there's no, there, there's no churches that I know of in that area. What about that area, Lord? What about those people? You know, we've, we've ministered in Poland a number of times. There's one partnering church in the whole of Poland, 38 million people. 90% of the towns in Poland don't have a Protestant church in them. Not a good church, just a Protestant church. 90%. Eddie Bucker says that in the whole of Europe, 250,000 towns and villages don't have one life-giving church. Ask the Lord to put a city on your heart that you can pray for. Number five, plant a life group. <laughs> plant a life group. Or be part of the planter. Go to the elders and say, I've got a lounge. Even if you're single and live in a one-bedroom flat, you can have a, have a life group. I had a friend, a single girl. She ended up with 60 people in her life group sitting in rows on her flat floor. Plant a life group because planting a life group is very similar to planting a church. Finally, 
Go to your elders and ask to be sent. Together with your elders, consider investing yourself in another partnering church or church plant. Go and visit um, Swaziland next weekend with the team. Make yourself available to go for a weekend, to go for a short-term visit, or maybe consider even a long-term visit. You see, just a normal family, you don't have to sing, you don't have to preach, you don't even have to be good at anything that you think is needed. You can't even pour the tea. You just have to turn up and tithe and say amen when the preacher looks like he's getting scared. <laughs> You've just got to turn up and smile at the visitor and offer, uh, offer to set the chair straight. You've just got to keep turning up. You say amen loudly from the, from the front row and you will make a difference in any church. Don't have to be fancy. you just got to turn up. I'm asking us this morning. Would you tear up your ticket to the Queen Mary? And sign up as a soldier for this battleship Christianity. Will you choose today to reorder the way you live your life? To make your resources available because everything changes when it's wartime. Amen. My goodness. <laughs> This is my second time hearing that. Eh? <laughs> and I say that because I've been challenged both times, like incredibly. Craig whispered in my ear when at the end of the first service, he said, I feel like a bit awkward being so cheeky on my first visit. I said, but we needed to hear that. And in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in his first preach, what stood out to me was he said, don't pursue peace above purpose. Phew, that thing just struck my heart. Because sometimes in the busyness of life, you just want peace, you know. And that really ministered to me. And then I can't remember which service it was, but he either said it or alluded to this lifestyle of being streamlined. And that thing stood out to me, actually, second service. That I've got to streamline my life even more. Because the more streamlined I am, the more flexible I am to do what he wants me to do, you know. So I think uh, we needed this, Craig. No... We needed this. And I just want to thank you for your courage and your boldness. And I think we need to respond, you know. And it's different for different people. Uh, we're, all, we're all in different positions, different situations. But all the Lord looks for is a response. Whatever it means to your world, that's what the Lord's looking for. So I'd love Craig to pray over us. And if you feel a response is required in whatever way of some form of adjustment that's needed... I want you to stand now, and I want Craig to pray over us. If you want to respond to something Craig said, would you please stand? I'm standing too. I told you how disquieted I've been over the last two weeks. I'm standing too. I was sitting in a meeting on Thursday next to a friend of mine who leads the church. <laughs> he turned to me and said, I shouldn't have heard that. <laughs> Sometimes you read a passage of the scriptures and you think, oh no, I've read it now. <laughs> I wish I hadn't. If I only just didn't know that passage. But now I've read it. <laughs> I'm in trouble. And sometimes we, 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 we hear things that we miss or we read stuff we don't even notice. But today, for some reason, the Lord has conspired to bring us together in one room. And He's brought you in a stage of your life that you're ready to hear or you needed to hear. You needed to look at these scriptures together. You needed to pursue purpose put aside our preference or our comfort it comes with streamlining your life there's this beautiful story a guy went and, and watched the recital of a world famous um, concert pianist and afterwards he got to speak to this pianist who'd played like, a, like an angel so beautiful he said man I would give my life to play piano like you the pianist looked at him and he said I did Apparently most of us this morning have given our lives to Jesus, but this morning it's like the Lord will say to you, will you give your life to serving me? I'm not telling you what that means. I'm not 
telling you how the Lord will tell you. It might be here, it might be there. It doesn't make a difference. But you've stood this morning because something in you has said, Jesus, my time is up. There's a crossroads. I faced a number of crossroads in my life where I knew the Lord, as though he was saying, Craig, this is it. You'll, you'll be just a pleasant Christian until you come to me if you don't choose now. Father, I pray as we stand together for my friends, my brothers and my sisters. Jesus, the reason why we stand is because we want to put you first. We want to come out of our tents and we want to look at the stars and we want to say, Jesus, could there somehow be a possibility that I could have part of that inheritance that fills the earth? I've been quite excited as I've spoken this morning and I don't want to harp you in the prayer simply to say, Jesus, I'm responding to you. I want to put these things in place. I sign up, Lord. I'm enlisting in that army. I'm taking my place. Whether I'm wounded or healthy, I'm still going to do my job. I'll let my friend patch me, but I want to get back on the, on the battlefront. Jesus, I'm surrendering my resources, my heart, my dreams to serving you. Your word says that the gospel will be preached in all the world so that then the end can come. Let me be part of that, Jesus, whether it's by making coffee or being a godly colleague, a parent that points to Jesus, a member of this community, a South African in this country and in other countries of the world. Jesus, would you take my life and use it for your purposes in Jesus' name. Amen.